who's going to work for a company that just wants to, you know, increase shareholder demands? It's just boring. It's it makes you want to take a take a shower, you know, uh, after you come back from work. There's there's nothing there for anybody. And, you know, we live in a world of human beings, so we want to think that what we're doing has value to people, real value, and that we're leaving the world a better place because of what we're doing. Podcasting from Boulder, Colorado. This is the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we dive into the story behind the story of today's most inspiring storytellers, creators, and entrepreneurs. I like big backstories, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Mark Gutman. I'm Mark Gutman, and on today's episode of Baby Got Backstory, how one of the world's most famous branding experts didn't even really start that part of his career until the ripe young age of 40. Now, if you like and enjoy the show, please take a minute or two to rate and review us over at iTunes. iTunes uses these as part of the algorithm that determines ratings on the Apple charts, and ratings help us to build an audience, which then helps us continue to produce this show. On today's episode, we are talking to one of my heroes, branding expert, Marty Newmeyer. Much of what I do every day and aspire to do comes from the teachings of Marty. I have consumed his thoughts, his books, and his philosophies, and I consider him a living legend. Most people in marketing, not just branding, own at least one of his distinctive white books with the big black type across the front. And for those of you who don't know Marty Newmeyer, he is an author designer, and brand advisor whose mission is to bring the principles and processes of design to business. His series of whiteboard books include Zag, which was named one of the top 100 business books of all time, and The Designful Company, a best-selling guide to nonstop innovation. His first book, The Brand Gap, and the one that I've come to love and, and many of my branding colleagues have come to love, has been read by more than 23 million people since 2003. A sequel, The Brand Flip, lays out a new process for building brands in the age of social media and customer dominance. And his latest book, Scramble, is a business thriller about how to build a brand quickly with agile strategy. In 1996, Marty founded Critique Magazine, the first journal about design thinking. Think about that. He was one of the first to be talking about design thinking. And he has worked with innovative companies such as Apple, Netscape, Symantec, Kraft Foods, Adobe, Google, Microsoft, Riot Games, and Capital One to help advance their brands and cultures. Marty was gracious to drop in for a long interview on the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we discuss the importance of brand and branding, how branding adds enduring value to a business, and why those businesses that focus on brand will be successful on the other side of this pandemic, and those that don't are going to be in trouble. Our conversation ranges from Marty's early days of branding, the Beatles, Leonardo da Vinci, ageism in the creative field, and what the future might look like for all of us. Marty says that branding is a field that brings business people and creative people together, and I couldn't agree more. And here is Marty Neumeyer. This episode brought to you by Wild Story. Wait, isn't that your company? It is. And without the generous support of Wild Story, this show would not be possible. A brand isn't a logo or a tagline or even your product. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or company. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. Wild Story helps progressive founders and savvy marketers build purpose-driven brands that connect their business goals with the customers they want to serve so that both the business and the customer needs are met. This results in crazy, happy, loyal customers that purchase again and again, and this is great for business. If that sounds like something you and your team might want to learn more about, reach out at www.wildstory.com and we'd be happy to tell you more. Now back to our show.
Marty, you're an acclaimed author, uh, having written several books on the topic of branding, books like The Brand Flip, Zag, and The Brand Gap. Uh, you are considered an expert on the topic of branding, and you are the director of CEO branding for Liquid Agency in Silicon Valley. And you also teach a five-tier program on brand mastery through your own company, Level C. So we do have a sense and an idea of where this story is going. But what I really want to know is where did it start? Marty, were you always into branding and, and, and branding the idea of branding as a young kid? I was not. I didn't know the word existed, you know. But I did get into uh, communications pretty early, at least in my head. I was seven years old when uh, I announced to my second grade class that I wanted to be a commercial artist. <laughs> um, and everybody said, well, you know, what? And the only reason I even knew that job title existed is because my mother went to art school and uh, she had taught me how to draw and um I took to it pretty well and became known for that. And by the second grade, I was the artist for the school. So that has a huge effect, a huge pull for kids when they're, you know, they're told at a young age that they're special for something. You know? And so I think it was right then I said, you know what, that's what, that's what I am. <laughs> and uh, all I have to do is wait long enough to be one. <laughs> and at that time, what was a commercial artist? What does that even mean? I think, you know, I thought it was like an illustrator, you know, someone who does illustrations for magazine covers and for, for anything, signs, signage, trademarks, anything like that. I had no idea, you know, but I knew drawing was involved and uh, I could do that. So as soon as I was old enough, I got myself into art school uh, at Art Center in Los Angeles. And that's that was my going to be my track. And somewhere along the way... I just realized, I think I was probably 20 years old, maybe even a little younger, that you could not be a really successful high-end graphic designer if you didn't have control over the words that were that you used in your, you know, on your in your layouts and so forth. Because they, you can't separate graphics and communication, you know, and the, the word part of communication. And I was having trouble finding uh, copywriters to work with that I could work with uh, as equal partners, you know, because the way copywriters worked in those days is they thought about the um, the intent of the communication and they wrote some things and they handed it to you and you would kind of illustrate it or lay it out as an ad or article or, you know, whatever it is. And um, that isn't really what I wanted to, that's not the way I wanted to do it. So I wanted to, you know, work with uh, copy people on a team together. Um, and I, you know, I tried to make that work, but eventually I figured it was easier to learn how to do the copywriting part myself. I could go a lot faster and there'd be no gap between the words and the pictures. They would be, they would each contribute, contribute equally. Uh, and so that led me to uh, the writing side of communication and I just kept doing that and, uh, you know, built a studio doing all that kind of you know, graphic design and some advertising, annual reports, corporate identity, all the kinds of things that could make money for designers. And um, it wasn't until, I don't know, probably I was 40 or something like that, that I realized that there was a gap between uh, what I thought good work was and what a company thought good work was. And the gap, the, the reason for the gap is that uh, they didn't know what I was trying to achieve or if it was any good at all. And I really didn't know what the business was trying to achieve. I just knew my little part of it. And sometimes I would, you know, get lucky and, and the company would prosper because of the work I did. And I always thought, well, why, why is it that sometimes my work is really valuable to a company and other times it's not? Well, it happened that when it, when it worked for the company, it was because it had, it accidentally uh, was on strategy. So um, I started just thinking about what is strategy and what is business? What's the difference between business strategy and design strategy? And can it, can it all be one thing? And so that led me to the world of branding and uh, starting with positioning. Uh, those great books by uh, Trout and Reese starting in, in 1970, they opened up a whole world for me talking about the the, the strategic um, intent of communication, of advertising, of marketing, and so forth, which I didn't 
know existed. So, you know, because designers, well, what do we do? We, we look at the work that other designers have done through the ages and we tr- want to fit into that continuum. So we try to do this great, exciting, inspirational work, but not really w- with, with regard to what companies are trying to achieve. Of course, we think we are, but uh, unless you're really intimate with what a company or a CEO is trying to do, um, you're, you're guessing a bit. So I needed to um, look into that. So that was a lot of reading, a lot of experimentation, and you know, nothing's easy. It takes years and years to be good at something. So, but I would say I was probably 40 by the time I r- really saw the problem. Wow. So that's, I have so many questions, Mario. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, just that one alone, like I think so often in our careers, you know, we think we either have to figure it all out really early or that by 40, we should have figured it all out. Right. It's really interesting to me that it, it, like what you're best known for, at least how I know you, and you've been a huge influence on, on my career, didn't even really happen until you were 40 and beyond. That, that, that just like blows my mind. And mostly beyond. And I think where it really started to um, be, become clear to me is when I was, oh, I was probably 50 at this point, I decided I would publish a magazine about the thinking behind graphic design. It was really the first journal about um, design thinking, uh, focused on graphic design thinking. Uh, it was called Critique Magazine. And um, so Critique was filled with um, interviews and articles about uh, famous graphic designers and advertising people and uh, the thought processes behind their work. And the more I started working in this area, I realized uh, the less we actually knew about what we were doing. We really didn't know what we were doing. There was a lot of kind of mythology about uh, what makes good design, what makes good advertising, good marketing. But it wasn't, there was no framework for it. There was no structure, you know, to, that would lead you to the, a solution that would really drive a business forward. And then I realized, well, what that framework is, it's branding. It's the, the kind of playing field that brings business people and creative people together. We can all agree that this is a game worth playing, uh, but we have to know our parts. We have to play our roles. We have to take our positions on the field. Um, and know what we're doing um, and where we're headed uh, in order to be successful together. And so when I figured that out, I, I pretty much changed my whole orientation to my work and stopped trying to um, uh, help graphic designers understand business, which is what I was doing with the magazine. It's like, you know, pay attention to business because this is where you this is where your work takes flight you know i mean you you really have to understand what you're doing for companies uh to be uh, successful in this um most designers didn't want to hear that they were really happy just doing the work the way they wanted to do it so i i decided to uh, turn the other way towards business people and say hey business people ceos marketing people design can do tons of stuff for you. You have no idea how powerful it is if you just knew how to harness it. So um, I, I created a business helping companies get their arms and heads around uh, this whole idea of branding and design and creativity as a consultant. Uh, and that worked great. We built a company on, on that and uh, uh, wrote the book, The Brand Gap, to define the problem. The problem is the gap between design and business strategy. And so that became the really became the focus of my work ever since. I kept writing books on the same subject because it it's actually uh, rich with uh, opportunity. So um, that's what I've been doing. I've got eight books now uh, all around this topic of, of the brand gap and um, the role of creativity in business and the opportunity for business of utilizing design in a way that can, you know, really drive like off the charts results for the company. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I'm just still so fascinated about how, and I, and I do want to talk to you about your books and get into those because I'm a, I'm a big student of those, 
But I'm just so fascinated that these books came so late to you and that this kind of second career came late to you. And the reason I'm so fascinated is it's really personal for me. I mean, we see in our industry, you know, this, this idea of ageism is like rampant, you know, especially in the creative field and design and branding. It's like all about younger creatives and younger people and, and what, what, what's the younger generation doing? And, and yet the, 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 the wisdom and the perspective is all coming for you, uh, after 40. And I mean, do you ever run into that today? Do you find that, you know, how do you maintain relevance? How do you stay relevant as you get older in the creative space and you have all these younger people pushing on you? Well, you know, I think what I've noticed is that whatever you age, how, you know, if you're already in business, if you're, let's say, solidly working in, a, in an industry, by the time you're 30, you're going to be equal uh, in your ability to accomplish things as someone who's in their 70s. I think you, you just bring something different to it. So if you're 30, you're going to bring uh, an awareness of... Um, the latest stuff that's happening in culture, right? Because you're going to be like, that's what you're going to care about is that stuff that's all around you every day. All that stuff, you're going to be right there with it. And you can bring that knowledge to your work. Now, you may not have the wisdom of someone who's 60 or 70, but you've got that. And you've got energy and nuances and uh, very little baggage, right? So as you get older, you have to deal with like what you are, what you already know is your problem. <laughs> you know, what you think is true and right and correct. You have to keep reinventing that for yourself. And that gets difficult because it's hard to keep up with what's happening now in culture and also do the things you really need to do, which is to learn from the past. I mean, that's where the wisdom comes from. It's like looking at the whole sweep of history going way back. And like, um, it's great to, uh, you know, think about what the latest advertising agency is doing, but also like check in on Aristotle. You know, he had some really amazing uh, insights that you could learn from. Uh, now, if, you know, someone who's 30 is probably not going to spend a lot of time thinking about Aristotle, but by the end of your career, be looking back uh, at history and trying to mine history for all its great wisdom and bringing that up to date. And you also have a duty and an opportunity to teach uh, younger people, some really interesting ways of looking at their work. Um, and, and, and by the same token, younger people can uh, bring that, that fresh world to you so that you're not totally um, out of touch with what's happening. But you get out of touch because you get ideas that have worked for you and they keep working for you. So you don't want to you know, have to work so hard to stay up with everything. But also you're spending time broadening your knowledge base. And that, you know, that just takes time away from staying in tune with what's on television or something, you know, what's on, what's on Quibi, you know, this week. So, so everyone has advantages. That's why someone who's 30 can compete with someone who's 70 and, and vice versa, as you have different strengths. Mm, I love that. Thank you. So you start every book that you have, at least the ones I've had and I've read, so I don't want to say every book, but at least the ones I've read, with an intro to that book that you're holding that is essentially an anti-book, <laughs> right? You, you always, you, you make these mentions that, hey, this is the fewest words possible. You make it a point to tell the reader that you've bought a short yet dense and informative book. Like, why are short books so important to you? Like, why, why do you always uh, intro your book that way? Well, if they are short, I do. Uh, it's for a reason. And uh, the reason is we're all very busy, you know, doing our jobs. And it's hard to find the time to move into a new new territory, a new area of understanding and keep working and, you know, bring in the, in the money to pay the rent and all that. So, you know, why would I like try to mon monopolize somebody's time? I want them to get out and start using this immediately. But at the same time, I don't want to offer them a shallow sense of anything. I want everything to be as deep as possible. So to do that, you have to really work on compressing your information down to the simplest possible way to say it so that it, A, communicates clearly and B, sticks in your head. So that's, that's actually the work of, you know, copywriters. That's what they do. They figure out how to say something in the least amount of space. So um, that, that skill uh, that I've developed has served me well uh, as an author is just, you know, use copywriting skills and also design skills. So designers can make things visual uh, that maybe aren't typically visual 
to help people uh, understand it and help it stick in your head. So there's those two skills together, especially when you use them in tandem, one and one equals three. So that's, that's the nice thing that I can bring to it. Uh, other than that, it's just reading and learning and trying out things, testing, uh, doing research, all these things that I'm uh, addicted to now at this part of my life. I just love learning more and more about it. So I just take that information and I use my design and writing skills to make a book that um, communicates clearly, just goes right into your brain like a laser and, and sticks there because it's, you know, if I do it well enough, it's memorable. So, but having said that, I've got a book that's not like that, Meta Skills, which is 300 pages of um, much, it's deep material that stays deep. It doesn't, it's not simplified because it has to be that way. So I've, on, uh, on that book, that's about developing skills for the, for this century, especially after the pandemic, you know, we're going to have a lot of new uh, opportunities and it's going to require new skills. So there are five skills that I write about meta skills, which are skills that, that can help you create or learn new skills. There's sort of the, the skill of skilling yourself. If that makes any sense. So that book is different. Um, and then I also wrote one called scramble that is not visual. It's uh, it's a thriller. So it's a business thriller that I use to explain the idea of agile strategy. So this is for strategy, business strategy and brand strategy together how do you create it? How do you do it fast and do it well in a you know our fast moving world of business today? So um, that's been an interesting process is to learn how to communicate business material in a, through a story, and um, I think it's working well. So I'll probably do some more of those too. But the whiteboard books, the ones you're referring to, like the Brand Gap, the Brand Flip, Zag, those are the you know the highly visual. Um, quirky, fun, condensed, um, brand books. Yeah. And thanks. Thanks for sharing that. How do you decide what, what topics to write on? I mean, writing a book is no small feat. It's certainly a lot of dedication and time. So it has to be something that, uh, you know, is worth doing. How, how do you decide what, what, what you're going to write on and, and what's worth uh, your time? I, you know, I think it's, um, being honest, I think it's, I write about stuff that bugs me. You know, when I think like, you know, people should really think about something in, in this way or you know, not, not the way they're thinking about it or the world really needs to change to embrace X. And typically in the beginning, I don't even see what it is that I'm going to write about very clearly. It takes a while to kind of go, yeah, that's the problem. It's, it's, you know, none of us really see this problem, but it's a real problem. And I can fix this. You know, I can. I can um, unleash people's creativity so we all can fix this. And so, I mean, the brand gap started just out of frustration. You know, I couldn't seem to get designers to care enough about business to know what they were doing within a business. I couldn't get business people to care enough about design so that they could manage it well. I thought that is really a lost opportunity. I have like two bodies of knowledge that are very um, sophisticated that can't work together and need to work together. So, um, you know, so the brand gap, and then and then when I was doing the brand gap, uh, I you know talking about it and giving workshops, people would say, "Yeah, these five disciplines that are in the brand gap, you know, differentiation, uh, innovation, etc." Th that really makes sense, but the differentiation one, where you have to be different than everybody else, that one is really uh, counterintuitive to me. I'm not really sure I get that, or I'm not on board for that. I just think, you know, we need to, if someone's making a lot of money in one area, you do what they do and you'll make money too. And uh, that's not how it works. So um, I decided I have to drill down on differentiation. So Zag became a drill down book just on this idea of positioning in positioning for difference, uh, making your company different, making it the only in its category so that you don't have to compete head to head with anybody and you, your profit margins can be higher. And that takes, you know, a definite uh, effort to do that. I mean, it's, it doesn't come naturally to people. We don't, we, we're not different naturally, you know, people, uh, well, some people can't help being different and maybe that's an advantage, but uh, a lot of people just want to be the same. They just want to fit in. They just want to be professionals. And that's actually not a very good, kind of impulse for 
for becoming great in your in industry, for standing out and having a brand that's really valuable. You have to purposefully do something different than your competitors. So that needed a book, right? And so uh, um, that succeeded really well. And then I started to realize, well, you know, even if you understand all this material, you as a company, you can't build a brand unless your company understands the whole concept of branding. They have to have all the processes in place to embrace and protect that brand. And that requ- that's going to require a, a culture change. You have to change your culture and um, to, be, to become innovative and to become brand-focused and brand-led. Uh, so I wrote the Designful Company, and that introduced, I think it was the first book about design thinking. You know, so that's that's how I, I write these books. I have a, like a, a burr under my saddle, and I just have to, I, I get angry. <laughs> angry enough to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so interesting. And you were, uh, you were like right on the forefront of design thinking. I didn't realize that, that your book was potentially the first book. I had always kind of attributed design thinking to this thing that IDEO invented. Where, where did design thinking come from, if, if not from there? Well, God bless IDEO. I mean, they have been so helpful uh, to the design field by explaining all this stuff and paving the way uh, for everybody else. Um, at my office in Palo, uh, Palo Alto, when I started this, when I was writing The Brand Gap, I was in a little, like a warehouse uh, because I just shut down my other business and it was full of all the junk from my last business. And I was there by myself writing my book right across the street was at the IDO headquarters. And so I got to know those guys and really be, become familiar with their, uh, what they were doing. And um, they wrote a lot about this topic too. So we were probably doing this at the same time, but I think my book was the first one to use design to actually describe the process of design thinking in its simplest, simplest way. Uh, IDO followed with some very specific books about uh, design thinking, and so did a lot of other people. Um, But even before that, my magazine, Critique, was about design thinking. So, you know, I'm not claiming credit for inventing design thinking, but I would say it was in the air probably as early as 1990. Oh, wow. It's quite a bit of history. I I love that. I love that. And so... You know, one thing I love about your story is is what I'm gathering, and please correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth or summing up incorrectly, is that you've tried a lot of different things. Like you you haven't just said, hey, I'm just going to try this, you know, magazine on design thinking. I'm just going to be a designer. Like you, you've really given yourself the ability to try different things, see if they work, you know, and, and success for you also doesn't sound like it's a zero sum game. Like I would suggest that critique magazine was a success but at some point you shut it down and then you you know you're doing something different so you know can you talk a little bit about this like propensity to to try different things to sprout out i mean to sprout up to contract to and kind of do it over and over again well you know what i like about being a designer is the ability the freedom that you have to invent to innovate to to experiment a little bit and uh, even when I was just, you know, in my 20s doing design, I always wanted to try different ways of communicating, you know, different ways of using graphics, words and pictures and combination, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was just endless fun trying all these things. I, I think all I did was then take that same uh, impulse to be inventive and move it up to a higher level of like, can I be inventive uh, with the concept of the work? Can I be inventive? with the uh, strategy behind it? Can I be inventive with my own career? You know, can I, do I have to do this all the time? Um, not that I didn't want to do it, but I just thought there's always something to explore. So maybe it's just um, a kind of curiosity and adventurousness that I uh, developed early on. And I was a big fan of the Beatles. You know, this is back in, in uh, when I was in high school, the Beatles came out. And uh, up to that time, you know, music was great. Rock and roll was great. And I, you know, played a guitar and I listened very closely to music since I was probably 10 years old. And I loved all the newness, the novelty of, you know, the top 40 and all that kind of stuff. When the Beatles came out, it was something like on a much higher level of creativity. I mean, much more intellectual, but still fun and accessible. And what they would do is they would give you some music that you could accept and then start to really like 
for its difference. And then just when you were comfortable with that, they'd come out with more music that was a little more different. Like they were always exploring. So every step they took was pulling you further into some area that you weren't expecting. And I just love that. And I just thought, that's what I want my career to be. I want to be exploring every opportunity and just like breaking the mold every time I can. And so, but at the same time, being a serious person who's, you know, is making a living with it and, um, and uh, is in demand uh, by industry and all that. So, um, you know, you, you, you can, you could do crazy stuff every day of the week um, and never really amount to anything in, in your life. So you, you don't want to do that. So you have to kind of stick with something, but I always wanted to be like trying something new, pushing the ball forward down the field. And that's the joy of it for me. So I, I would say I kind of reinvented myself about every 10 years like in a fairly serious way, but not in a way that would surprise anybody. It's just like maybe just take a step to the left or to the right or a, le- a little bit of a leap forward. Or and It just means really that you have to be willing to abandon what was working before to try something that might not work. But, you know, that that's kind of a defining characteristic for me. So it's, uh, you know, I loved doing it and I still love doing it. So that's why I'm, when I look back, I, I could never have predicted I'd be teaching branding right now to professionals. I just, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't even know what it was. So I just wanted to be a commercial artist, you know? Um, so don't, don't hold yourself back and say, no, I, I'm an accountant and I can't be anything but an accountant. You know, uh, you'd surprise yourself just, uh, you know, imagine some, something else you might enjoy and take a few steps towards it. See if you like that. Um, and eventually you'll jump and do that. And that'll be great until it's not. And then you'll be ready to jump again. Uh, I mean, and so in that light, do you consider yourself a brander or a marketer? Oh, brander. Yeah. To me, marketing, uh, it's way more tactical than branding. So marketing is really about how do I sell stuff now? How do I, um, create revenues this quarter like it's it's an ongoing challenge it's like you, you're in a, a a live sports event you're you're playing on the field and you've got to like score 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 branding is more about strategy it's a long term it's a long game and um so it's more like having a sports career than a sports game you know for the company it's it's really uh thinking about how do we make money now and 20 years from now to make sure that um, we, we've grown in that 20 years, we've grown, we've become more important, more solid, uh, less vulnerable to the shifting winds, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really rises to a higher level in a, in a company or in a business. Um, and I would say I'm, I'm starting, this has taken me a long time to, to believe this, but the more I study this and, and, and research it and test it, the more I think branding deserves a spot right next to the CEO at that level of leadership um, has to be uh, all about brand. So think about um, someone who is very successful at this, Steve Jobs, um, CEO of Apple, you know, was the world's, maybe still is the world's uh, most successful rich company um, out there. And he was, his title was CEO, but he didn't really do the kinds of things that CEOs are known to do. Um, he didn't really care that much about the shareholders and taking care of them. Um, he didn't look at spreadsheets and worry about finance. I mean, that was somebody else's job. His job was to make sure he had customers, like rabid customers, <laughs> rabidly loyal customers who would buy anything that he decided to put out. And he worked really hard at that, was fanatical about it. And so that, you know, it was very rare for Steve Jobs to put out a, a, a product that just wasn't successful. He did it, but, you know, it happens. But he was very careful about being successful every time out, making sure that the product they were producing and selling was the right product at the moment. And so what does that take? Well, it takes um, some sense of what your customers want. You have to think like a customer. You have to understand your customers really well. You have to take responsibility for their delight. Right. So he had to create the products that he thought they would need if they only knew they existed. He had to make sure that the products were unique, uh, somewhat unique anyway. You know, they didn't have to be the first, but they had to be the best. That they had an ample, an Apple 
um, look and feel, um, that they were designed beautifully, that they worked beautifully, that they had the ethos of Apple. All that stuff, that's a lot of work. And, it, and typically it takes one very strong-willed person to make that happen. So that person needs to be pretty high up in a company, whether he's the CEO or she's the CEO, or the, what I would say is more practical is a CBO, chief brand officer. There needs to be somebody responsible for that stuff, the stuff that makes customers loyal. That's, that's the highest level of work you can do in a company. The rest is mostly um, operations and bookkeeping. So um, you, you don't have a company without customers. Right? You can have customers without having a very good company. You won't, you won't last long, but you could do it. The customers are the main thing. And so what you're really designing is not because you're designing customers. And that is tricky work. And we're just now starting to understand how it's possible to make that happen. And that area of work is called branding. And so why do you think that we're not seeing that more often today? Why are we not seeing more people having CBOs and people sitting right next to the CEO and thinking more like Steve Jobs and less like what we kind of see as a traditional CEO, which is, you know, hey, I got to take care of shareholders and financial spreadsheets and whatnot. I think it's um, that that um, tradition um, makes things, you know, keeps things from changing. Tradition, uh, you know, we've been having, you know, business has been going on for, for uh, many centuries now. Uh, really picked up in the 1500s, uh, and now it's really going well. Uh, and uh, schools reflect the knowledge base that you need to to be in business, and they are very slow to change. Tradition moves slowly, and so it takes innovators to kind of break out of that. And until enough of them are successful, nobody is willing to follow. It's it's just too important to to succeed. I mean, success is so important that people don't take risks. They're risk averse. Um, and the bigger the company is, the less uh, risky they tend to be. Um, but then you see, you know, people like Steve Jobs, you know, hugely successful and people are going, well, how do we do that? I mean, where do you, where, what school do you go to to learn how to do that? Well, Steve Jobs didn't go to any school. He figured it out. And I think we're still at that figuring out stage. But it's, you know, it's the reason I started uh, Level C with my partner, Andy, Andy Starr, is to uh, bring this little part uh, which I think is going to be a much bigger part of the business called branding uh, up to a level of professionalism so that um, it's a thing. Like people know that this is the work that we're doing. In fact, it could be the, the central work of any company is creating a, and the normal CEO skills are not going to do that for you. Right. Um, so, so who's going to do it? Well, I think it's going to, I think it's, going to be a lot of business people getting into branding, but it's also going to be a lot of people who are creative, more creative, that really know how to communicate and do strategy um, to understand the social element of a business, getting in and taking a lot of responsibility. Um, so that's what we're looking for. It's happening. It's not happening as fast as I thought it would, considering how powerful it is. But, um, you know, things take their, they take as long as they take. And, but I think that's the direction we're going in and there's no turning back. Well, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, the thing I find like, and I'm sure you run into this all the time as well. Like anytime I talk to a client, anytime we start branding and I'm like, Hey, tell me who you want to be like. They're like, I want to be like Steve Jobs. I want to be like Apple, but they don't want to do the things <laughs> that make them like <laughs> Steve Jobs. Or make, yeah. Make, yeah. So yeah, they want the results without doing the work. Um, yeah, sure. No. Yeah, but but that's that's the job of consultants and uh, writers, people like me, teachers, to say, okay, there's actually a way to do this. You have to. This is what you need to know about it. A lot of things in your company are to change to make this happen. You know, the, Apple is not. That just wasn't one person. You know, uh, Apple is uh, a whole bunch of people under one person's direction doing things in a way that no other company was doing them. And so there are lots of companies out there experimenting with that now too. Apple's just happens to be the, one of the earliest and the most uh, beautiful of them, you know, the most perfect of them. But uh, it's it's happening everywhere. It's uh, I just think um, it, it, it's frustrating for people like you probably because you can see where things need to move to, and they're not moving fast enough. 
But just think about all the people that don't have that vision yet. They haven't seen it. Um, it's going to take a lot of time. And eventually, though, I think you'll, you'll go to the university and you'll get a branding degree, you know, and it'll be really robust. It'll be great. Uh, and maybe you'll even have to take some art classes <laughs> or other, you know, creative classes to go along with that. And, and I think that'll be great. I think, you know, the world got, sp- this is my theory, okay, the, the world got split up into two paths back in, um, in the Renaissance. And um, the example in the Renaissance of um, a really smart, talented person was Leonardo da Vinci, because he, would, he was artistic and creative, super creative, but he was also really scientific and logical at the same time. He could do both of those things. He made those two things work together as one. So you, um, it's a metaphor for having your left brain and your right brain working together as one unit. And what I, what I think happened was that um, that example, his example, which we now know about, was unknown at, because his notebooks uh, never out. I mean, he meant to publish those notebooks, but he was afraid to publish them because he didn't want to lose any, he didn't want to give his competitors uh, a leg up. So he kept those notebooks very uh, secret, meaning to, always meaning to um, publish them when he, before he died and he never got around to it. He, and then he gave the, uh, the project to his assistant before he died. So you, you get them published. <laughs> and the assistant, uh, Francesco Melzi, failed to do it also. He wasn't very good on follow through either. And so those notebooks just got lost. Um, they filtered out into various houses in Europe. And they were, he was basically unknown for 200 years. Nobody knew, nobody had that example of how you can use art and science equally uh, to make something that needs to by itself. So um, art went one way, it became like what we know now is just kind of art for people's homes and museums and everything. And then, then we've got, um, you know, science uh, went into manufacturing and all kinds of stuff like that, and never the twain shall meet. And so uh, business has had, you know, 100 years of being mostly about science and logic and dollars and cents and just being very narrowly defined. And now we need that example of Leonardo da Vinci. We need, we need the creativity, the logic, the, the magic and the logic working together to create a company that lasts. That's really important. And, and we don't have that anymore. So we're, we're trying to get it back. That's what's happening. So universities have the ability, if to, to, to those the art and the science programs back together so that they influence each other and, uh, and then that in turn will influence business management and we'll see business that is, businesses that are much more human focused and that will be good for business. That'll be good for capital and that's gonna be good for society, uh, good for everything. Uh, and at this point, it's up to the creative people to make that case because I don't think traditionally educated business people know how to get that i think they want it they want jobs they don't know how to do it if you know how to do it then you should be in there uh pitching you know you should, you've got to get in there and um connect the dots for uh business people and and make all this possible so that's what i've been doing i've been i'm in the fight you know to to bring uh humanity back into business um not just because i want it that way but because it'll be successful that way and I'm, and I'm thinking uh, we're, in a, a par- we're in a paradigm shift right now caused by the pandemic and the collapse of the economy that's going to shake everything up. It's, it's going to shake the snow globe, you know, and, and create a lot of opportunity for people who can embrace change and find a place in this new future, whatever it's like. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be the future we've been trying to make happen, but we got stuck because of tradition. So uh, tradition is getting broken up right now, at least temporarily, and that's that's a, a chance to to get in and, and do some new things. And I think what'll happen: uh, businesses will become more brand focused. They'll they'll try to delight customers uh, more. They'll try to protect customers instead of uh, just milking them for their cash. You know, which is not a, a very good long term strategy. Long term strategy is helping customers become who they want to become. And uh, if you can do that, you'll be very valuable to your customers and they will stick with you 
beyond reason, right? They'll, they'll, they'll stick with you even when you're not doing a good job if they trust you because you're, you've been helping them. It's, it's very simple, um, but we just don't have the, the, the framework to understand that from a business standpoint. So, you know, I'm working on it. I got eight books on the subject and um, I'm certainly finding a lot of CEOs that are interested in, in adopting um, a more brand focused uh, way of leadership. So um, I, I think I think it's going well. I just think if, you know you, you only have so many years in your career, and you, you can easily get frustrated that it's not moving fast enough. But it moves as fast as it moves. <laughs> and such is life. I mean, I and love your I, I love your vision of of uh, what the snow globe may look like <laughs> uh, on the other side of this. But you know, what's hard about branding? Like, what what just what doesn't the normal person see, or what don't we know? Like, what's hard about this as a discipline? Well, the first thing is that most people don't know that branding is more than logos. I mean, that's, that's, you know, the vast majority of the world thinks branding is about sticking logos on things or, you know, colors and typefaces maybe, um, or maybe advertising or, you know, marketing. Branding is not, it's, it's much more than that. It's, it's about giving customers something that makes them better people and um, in, in the largest sense. And, Yes, that, in, that, that demands that you make uh, products that they think are valuable, that are respectful of them and, and society and the environment. Uh, it, it means um, communicating the values of those products or services um, in a clear way that, so they understand the product is for me. It requires that companies build themselves around their brand and um, have a purpose that's it goes further than just wanting to make profits. You know, a company needs to have a purpose beyond making money today if they want to succeed. If their only purpose is to grow to be a $5, million, $5 billion company and sell it off to somebody else, they'll probably succeed at that, but they won't create anything of lasting value. It'll just, their company will be absorbed by somebody else. They may or may not do anything good with it. So you can do that, but... Um, if you want to create businesses that last and create um, that are satisfying to everybody, you need to think about purpose. What's the purpose of this company beyond making money? What do, what do we want to do for the world? Um, and and so I'm I'm pretty cheered up about that. That actually that message got through to people. There's very few instances anymore where you see that um, you know a statement on somebody's website that says the purpose of our company is to return or to to increase shareholder returns, you know, or something really bland, uh, having only to do with profitability. It's always got to be more than that because who's going to work for a company that just wants to, you know, increase shareholder demands. It's just boring. It's, it's, it makes you want to take a, take a shower you know, <laughs> uh, after you come back from work. It's like, you know, it's just, there's, there's nothing there for anybody. And, you know, we live in a world of human beings. So we want to think that what we're doing has value to people, real value, and that we're leaving the world a better place because of what we're doing. It's not easy to do, but that's that's the that's the goal. Really great companies. So, I mean, Apple is certainly that way. If you want to go back to them, Apple wants to um, improve everybody's minds. You know, I mean, they want to push evolution forward. You know, so that's pretty big, and you, you can go to work and be happy about doing that kind of work. Um, Google, for example, um, I don't trust them as much as I used to, but they had the right idea when they started out, which was let, let's um, catalog all the world's information and make it easily accessible to everybody. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, and I've certainly benefited from that. It's really helped me in writing my books and learning and all kinds of stuff is to get all this free information about the world. So people were you know, like getting in line to work for Google. I mean, and uh, and the stock valuation um, reacted appropriately to that. You know, it's super valuable. Amazon stock is doing really well. Amazon has a very narrow miss mission, which is to be the most customer-centric company in the world. And I think they've done that. Um, they haven't been great necessarily to their employees or to, to other businesses. They've kind of trampled, uh, you know, the competitors. And I think they owe the world a lot after their success um, and they need to pay back, pay back for that. But you could see how having that lofty goal is what really drove them to such heights. 
So you need that. And um, so be careful what you wish for too. Whatever you decide uh, you want to do for the world, you may be very successful. And so you have to start then thinking about, well, uh, have we done any damage? And we, how do we um, get a net positive out of uh, our contribution to the world? Mm. Just want to think about that for a second. Let that s- simmer, s- settle a little bit. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I've been talking a lot about sort of law ideas of branding and everything, but it also is important at the surface level of branding, like what you say, how you say it. You know, what are the messages like? What kind of words are they using? Is there poetry in it? Is there um, are they powerful words? Are are the images sticky? Do you you know um, are they beautiful? Are they memorable, all these kinds of things that we typically think of as being in the realm of branding, they are still important, right? So important at every level. Uh, So I think for me, having come from uh, advertising, marketing, design, and and having been in the trenches was really a good background for going into brand strategy and brand education, because I know what it takes to do it. It's not easy. Um, it's as hard as any kind of art form and takes as many brains and skills and all that kind of stuff and collaboration to do that as anything else. And I really um, think without that, you may have great strategy, you may have great intentions, but the rubber never meets the road because you don't do a very good job on the actual stuff that people see, the, what we call the touch points. So all that, the design of all those touch points, the places where customers come in contact with the brand, they have to be great. They have to be clear, beautiful, powerful, all those kinds of things. And you could spend your whole career just learning how to do some of those things. And that's fine. For me, I just felt like I, I did a lot of those things. And um, I was getting frustrated that maybe my work wasn't um, landing the way it should uh, in, in a business way, in a business sense, or uh, what connecting or I wasn't being appreciated for it in some cases. Uh, or maybe I was being too appreciated for it because it really wasn't working. That's not very uh, that's not very satisfying thing. Either. So I just felt the for me the place I could go to do the um, good was is into this whole idea of what branding. How can I get everyone on the same page so we can all work together to do something good for uh, customers and the company and society. And it's all it's all there in branding. I mean, it, you, you definitely can do it, and it's going to take. Uh, every ounce of effort that you have to to be good at it, uh, which I really love. I just love it to be challenging. Yeah, and you know that that's a great segue into to this question for you. In that we've spoken a lot about what companies can do around branding and, and benefit from branding, but what advice do you have for people like myself, uh, brand strategists, agency owners? Like, what should we be looking to in order to be you know that that next level, the, the leaders in branding and delivering the most value to our clients, which is obviously what we, we should be wanting to do. Well, you can deliver value at different levels. So one is um, you can be the person that does the design or the message creation for touch points, essentially, which is where I started. The important thing there is understanding where you fit in. Like what's, what is, what's this branding thing that I'm contributing to? What is, what's expected of me? How do I know when I've been successful? How can I sell what I'm doing? Because I can prove that it's successful in, a, in the right context that makes sense to a business person. So there's that. Um, and then, then you might move, want to move into brand strategy. And, and then you have to be the connector between all these touch points, the creation of these touch points and some business result. You have to be able to sell that and manage that. So how do you do that? Well, you you read. <laughs> so I do everything. I read about it and then I try it out. You have to have a theory before you practice it. So you know, practice is great. You can learn a lot from your own experience, but without a theory to test against, you really don't learn that much. So you need to have a theory um, like, oh, maybe I can try this and I'll measure that result and, um, and see how we're doing. So I'll give you a, a concrete example because I'm getting a bit abstract here. So once upon a time, I had a design firm, and I was designing the retail packages for for business software. That's I decided that I could specialize in that and probably be the only one that knew enough about it to to warrant being paid a lot of money for it. 
essentially. So if I could be the first one to really understand how to design a software package so that people in the store would pick it up, look at it and go, that's for me. I'm going to pay $200 for that, that product just based on a package. So I thought if you could do that, um, your work would be very valuable to a company. So that, that's, that's what I did is I just learned how to do that really, really, really well. While I was doing that, I understood that well, I started to realize when I talked with my clients that they would, I would have to ask them questions like, um, okay, for this package that we're designing, I need you to tell me uh, the one reason that people are going to buy this product instead of the one right next to it that does the same, you know, a similar thing. Why, why would they want to buy this word processing program instead of the word processing program right next door on the shelf? And they would say, well, um, I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't. I, you know, I don't know. Well, we have, no, wait a minute. We have these features, this feature, this feature, this feature. And then I could say, well, you know, this other product has this feature, this feature, and this feature also. How does yours differ? Well, we have this other feature that you, you missed. We have that. Is that important? Well, no, that's not really important. Okay, so we have a problem. Your product is not different <laughs> than the other one. Um, and they would say, oh, yeah, you're right. And I, then I would say, if you had something <laughs> that would really differentiate you from the competition, then we could play that up and we could make a big deal out of that one thing that you have that that other product doesn't have. So then they are saying, you ought to come to the meeting where we're going to be talking about the next uh, iteration of the software because your views would be really interesting. And so I was learning strategy and I started reading more about it. Like, what is a business strategy? How does it, how do you know when you're successful? How do you measure it? All those kinds of things. And soon I got to the point where the packages that we were designing were selling the software so well that it could like increase sales three to five times over the previous time just by changing the package. When companies found that out, then they realized they could they would pay a lot of money for that service. And I didn't need to be charging by the hour anymore. I could charge by the package and I could charge anything I wanted, really, because no one else knew how to do this. That was a huge, you know, epiphany for me that um, the price you charge for something doesn't, isn't based on the hours you put into it. Right? It's based on what it does, uh, you know, because all my life I've been charging by the hour. So um, I started charging quite a bit of money for these software packages. And then it got to the point where, um, because we went to the store and we tested these our prototypes in a store with actual customers. We got to know the salespeople in the store and the store owners and so forth just because we're there all the time testing uh, prototypes on the shelf to see which one would be the, the best selling, selling package. Um, after a while, uh, when a software publisher would bring their uh, product to a store like CompUSA, which was a big deal at the time. I guess there's and fries is another one. It was maybe fries is still going. I don't know. They go into the store with the product and say, "Look, we have this new product, uh, and we can you we will you take it? Will you put it on the shelves?" And they'll say, "Well, you know, we don't bother demonstrating the product. We know it works. I mean, you guys know what you're doing. It's not our job to test your product. We'll assume that the product works, but your package is just not good enough." You know, it just, it's not. Why do they have this opinion? Because they've been talking to us for years um, and seeing what we knew to be a good package and being in on this conversation until they knew enough about it to say, no, that's never going to sell. You got everything in the wrong place in that package. You just like, it's a mess. Uh, we can't take a package like that. So I'll go back and redo it and we'll, we'll talk about it. And the, <laughs> the publisher would say, well, we paid, you know, we paid fifty thousand dollars for this. I don't know what else we could do. And they write out our name and our, my phone number and give it to them and say, "Look, talk to these guys. They'll fix you up and come back." <laughs> so, so it wasn't, um, you know, long before we were charging eighty thousand dollars for a package, for the same package we would have charged ten thousand dollars for years ago. But now we know more about it, and you know, we have a reputation for it. We have a brand. Our brand is the people that do the software packages. And we got, you know, all the work came through us. So that, to me, was just eye-opening. That, you know, 
that when you, your reputation could have a value beyond the actual value of what you're producing. Just the reputation alone is worth money to your client or your customer. So that's what I would say is anybody in consulting can do the same thing. When you have a specialty that no one else has and it's valuable to companies and you can prove it, uh, you have no competition really. And when you charge more for that service, it doesn't hurt your chances of making money. It actually probably enhances your chances because the expense will cost a lot. If they think you're the best at something, you better cost a lot. So this is a, a, a you know a situation in which charging more money actually makes you seem more valuable, and that's where you want to be, and that's what branding can do. So once you know that and you have a sense of how to get there, what's stopping you? I mean, you figure out what you're going to do that's really different than anybody else, that's very valuable and preferably in an area growing where you can grow with it and just do that. Just present yourself as that, a specialist in something and make sure that you are the best in that something and that you can prove it. And you'll enjoy that because you'll get more, you know, you'll make more money. You'll have more options. You'll have more respectful clients, fewer competitors. And eventually if you get tired of doing that same thing over and over, you reinvent yourself. Oh, that's such, such a great share. Thank you, Marty. I, I so appreciate it. So you're always reinventing yourself. What's what's next for Marty Newmeyer? Well, I, I think I'm doing what's next now. It's pretty new. This uh, thing called Level C. Level C is a boutique brand school that pops up anywhere in the world. It tends to be mostly popping up in Europe and London and also then in, in, in the U.S. Um, several times a year. And professionals like you take classes uh, that are just two-day intensive workshops where you learn something specific about branding. So there's five levels. So you're learning five levels of branding. And it gives you enough material to probably keep you busy for a year or two using all this stuff and making money from it. And so you're ready to go up to that next level if you choose to do that. Some people won't. They'll just take the first master class. Uh, and become a certified brand specialist. And they'll just use that for five, ten years, you know, and, and, and do really well with it. Some, some will say, though, I love that and I'm doing well, but I, I want to drill down into strategy more, become a strategist. Also, the money's better in being a strategist. So that may be one of the reasons they want to do it. So they take the next master class and they learn that. And uh, from there, they can go to become a brand architect which is um, working on complex three-dimensional brands where you've got multiple brands that you're juggling and, and um, creating the architecture for. It's called brand architecture. It's how all the brands fit together inside a company, how the portfolio is assembled, um, which is really valuable work. Uh, from there, we um, believe that a lot of people will want to become brand trainers um, because when you start to instruct people in your subject area, you learn a lot more than you learned to get to that point. So, you know, when you, if you really want to learn something, teach it. That's the, that's the uh, saying. And I think that's been very true for everybody I know. So, um, so the fourth level of uh, the level C brand program is being an instructor. And after you learn how to do that, and you've, you've taught some classes, some master classes, you're ready to teach that to, a CEO or to a whole company, right? So we hope that people will go into the top, the brand master level, which will um, equip them uh, along with their other skills that they've been learning the whole time uh, to be a CBO, chief brand officer, or somebody very high up in a company that has influence over the whole brand. So that's the top level. And when they graduate from that, they'll they'll have their hands full and they'll have a lot of work. Uh, we're starting to see. Lots of need for chief chief brand. You were talking about that before. Why isn't why aren't there a lot of chief brand officers? Well, there are going to be, and they're already starting to uh, pop up these openings for for um, that position. Part of it is it's new, so you have to sell yourself as that. You have to say, look, what I do is I work at the top of an organization to manage all, all the stuff that makes customers loyal, 
and then you your salary figure and and uh, hope you you get a job. And the salaries for this kind of work that we're seeing already, even in this earliest are would take your breath away. I mean, I had no idea that um, that kind of pay that much to get people of that caliber, but they will. I'm not going to throw around figures because I'm not. Um, I think that could be manipulative, but let's just say that they're they're they are breathtaking. You'd probably be better off taking one of these jobs than starting your own company. Let's put it that way. I think you'd make more money. So that's exciting. And um, so, you know, I've got, a, I've got my hands full. We're creating these classes, one, one class per year. It's a lot of work to put together a class. Um, it takes about a year. So we've, we're up to the second class now. The, next year we'll have level three, next year level four, and next year level, level five. And we're getting people that are taking all the, just moving up through all the courses. And then new people getting in all the time. So the result of this that I find really exciting and satisfying is that it's building a whole community of people that understand branding in a certain way, in a very clear, simple way, but with all different kinds of talents and backgrounds. So they're all bringing their, their, themselves to this, but they're using the same framework uh, as each other. And so they can all work together. And so th- there'll be thousands of people that could actually work on teams together uh, at various levels after we're done with this. I'll we'll probably never be done with it. Um, I just think it'll probably just keep growing. But um, I'm not looking for my next thing yet. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and we'll make sure to link to Level C in the show notes so that everyone has access to that and can look into that. I know I'm excited about some of the events you have uh, coming later this year. So we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. Marty, as we close out here, what do you think it, your 20-year-old self would say to you if you ran into him today? <laughs> to me, <laughs> you go, he would not be interested in me. <laughs> My 20 year old self says, Oh, God, why would I? I don't care anything about branding. All I care about is design. So, um, but I, I, I would probably be mystified, actually. <laughs> uh, in fact, most of my students are much older than 20. So they're, you know, anywhere from 30 to 70. <laughs> so I guess who are, are, have been in business, they're successful already at some level. They just want to take it to the next level. So I don't have a lot of 20-year-olds. But if I were, but looking back, if I just were to talk to my 20-year-old self, I might have some advice. You know, I would probably say, don't limit yourself to what you thought you could be. Uh, let yourself imagine greater things. Like, the, the main thing you have to do is find out what you admire about other people in the world and the work they're doing and, and, and assure yourself, reassure yourself that you could actually do work at that level. If you want to write like Hemingway, you could write like Hemingway. If you're 20 years old, there's nothing stopping you from learning how to do that. It's going to take you a while. It may take your whole life, but you can do it. You don't have to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm no genius. You know, I'm no Einstein. You might be an Einstein, okay? <laughs> Um, in your own way. You're not going to be Einstein, Einstein. You're going to be you, Einstein. So um, I think I would have just reassured myself, that uh, my younger self, that don't think small, uh, think big, and give yourself time to take that journey. Just go one step at a time. Don't kill yourself. Just keep focused, keep pushing, keep stretching. You'll get there. And that is Marty Neumeyer. I just loved his idea of always reinventing himself and always exploring, just like the Beatles. I also firmly believe that branding does belong right next to the CEO if we're not there already. Huge thank you again to Marty and Level C. You can find out more about Level C and the certification Marty teaches in the show notes. Well, that's the show. Until next time. Make sure to visit our website, www.wildstory.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. I like big stories and I cannot lie. You other storytellers can't deny. 